Welcome to the Past and Study here on Smooth 88.1 WHOV, iHeartRadio, right here, y'all on Facebook Live. We are back for another season. We are excited. Uh, we got with us in the house today, Commonwealth Attorney for the City of Hampton, Anton Bell is with us. We call him Pastor Law here <laughs> at the show. Pastor Law, how you doing, man? I'm good, you? I'm doing good. Doing okay. good. Okay. We, we have with us, ladies and gentlemen, please pull over and stop your cars. <laughs> we know, fellas, the ratings will be higher today because we have with us not one, but two doctors. <laughs> Alvian Lyons is in the building, relationship expert. Dr. Lyons, doctor is what we call it here because she has two doctoral degrees. How are you doing today, man? I'm awesome, guys. I am absolutely awesome. And always great to hang out with my brothers. You know, I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. We enjoy you hanging out with us, too. You make us look good, right? So <laughs> then we got Bishop Ray Johnson, the Million Outreach Worship Center. How are you today, sir? Well, yo, oh, he's, he's on mute. mute. He's <laughs> on mute, y'all. Pray for him. Pray for him. <laughs> As I, was, up already. as I was <laughs> saying, it's always good to be on the show <laughs> for another wonderful Tuesday. <laughs> Blessings to you, Attorney Ben. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Saying. I'm sure we're here about that more off air. <laughs> they did a producer <laughs> extraordinaire. <laughs> Jason Covington is with us. What's up, Jake? There's so many things I want to say right now, but we are on air. <laughs> So I'll just say good morning, good afternoon, Kanishiwa, Buenos Dias, Pastor Bishop Johnson. I love you, sir. I, I love you so much, man. Now, now, look, before we jump into the show, uh, because of, of when we tape our show, we can't get into football like we used to do. And I know some people might be happy about that, but the football season has started. So I need everybody today to stake your claim on your team. We're not waiting to the Super Bowl until then you go say on the air, that was my team. So <laughs> I need everybody today to stake your claim for your team. I'm gonna come back around again. Just tell us who your team is. You can't say nobody. We, that's not gonna fly here on the show. You got to pick somebody on the show. So Commonwealth Attorney, stake your claim. Who's your team, man? Denver. Denver Broncos. Yes. Yeah. Is what? that for Russell Wilson? Yes, I keep telling y'all, Harrison B was good to me. So okay. wherever Russell goes, that's where I'm going. So for those who don't know Harrison B, Harrison B. Wilson was the president of Norfolk State University when I graduated, and I went on a full ride all four years, and they were very, very good to me. So I have a fondness for his grandson, who is Russell Wilson. Ooh. Yeah, and you might be the only one in Hampton Roads that's Whatever. a Denver Bronco fan. But that's all right, though. It's good. It's I'm good, a, though. But, but I'm a ride or die type dude. That's okay. You ride or die. I, so I'm you were in Seattle. You were Seattle last year. You're Denver this year. That's that's all go. that matters. So, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm Russell Wilson all day long. Okay, that's fine. We need everybody that's watching, that's listening, stake your claim. Drop it in our feed, the Pass the Study Facebook page. Put your team in now. Don't be coming for us at the Super Bowl talking about that was my team. No, you drop it now, today. So you have heard Commonwealth Attorneys Denver Broncos. Bishop, I think we already know who your team is, but go ahead and stick your claim, man. Yeah, so the no-name team, Washington, is my team. I don't care what nobody said. Well, I can't say that on the radio. Um, you just you know. said it. <laughs> you just said it. Well, no, the, I said the team, but, you know, I ain't with the last name, so I can't, you know, I just can't deal with it. Okay, so the Washington team, that's that's who you root for. That's, yeah. that's your team. Yeah. It don't right. matter what their name is, they ain't going nowhere. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't going nowhere. So, I'm All just right. saying. Miss Alvia, stake your claim. Who's your team? Look, I am team whatever Matthew Lyons is loving this year, okay? So far, <laughs> it has remained the Giants despite how many seasons they have had as, you know, the midgets. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> but I am... I And I'm not using that as a derogatory term, y'all, okay? You, just you know they were coming. Clear. You know okay? they were coming. Just to be crystal clear, I was just talking about the opposite of Giants, okay? 
no people referenced in my statement. Right. But yes, I am. I'm loyal to whatever my man's with. That's our team. So we're from New York. You know what that means? It's either Jets or Giants when you're from New York. All right, New York in the house, giant fan. All right, Jason, stake your claim, man. Well, I need somebody to hit the organ because the Bible says in Isaiah 40, oh, no. one, it says, <laughs> but they shall wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not, and not faint. faint. <laughs> so I, I'm in the word, so I have to stay with the Philadelphia Eagles. I know that's right. <laughs> That must be why you got your shirt and towel today. You preaching today, huh? Is that what it is? <laughs> I, I feel God. I feel God. I feel good this morning. I feel good. Yeah, you know, look at pastoral today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going with my boys, Pittsburgh Steelers. We sticking with them. I'm not sure what kind of season we're gonna have this year, but you know I'm what? Sure. I'm a ride. A, I'm a ride or die, just like you, <laughs> Anton. You ride with uh, Russell. I'm riding with my Steelers. There you we'll go. See, we'll see where it go. We'll see where it go. All right, we're going to jump into the show today. Last week, we had a hot sauce show, and sure, uh, we talked about hot topics and what caught our eye over the summer, and a Commonwealth attorney started us off. We couldn't even get off of his topic last sure week. sure couldn't. Because we was talking about Future and Russell Wilson and, and the state of how people are choosing who they would prefer to be like, and that kind of led us down a path, and we were talking about that all of last week. It wasn't intended to be the whole show, but just, just how we roll here. We just go with it. And so, uh, Alvy, and you are up today. We're picking up where we left off on hot topics. What caught your eye over the summer? Well, you all know that, you know, the conversations around what it means to be a Black woman in America is a constant conversation, right? Uh, as people of color, we're always navigating that component of our identity. Sometimes it's very much to our benefit, that is to say, in terms of the excellence that has come out of our communities of color. But it certainly has also come with some real struggles, right? And so I found it very interesting. And this is just towards the end of the summer. And just recently, there were some articles on it and certainly um, some commentators who were referencing in it. And it was um, CNN uh, host Don Lemon was shocked by Meghan Markle's admission that she only recently begun to understand what it is like to be a Black woman and says that she's coming from a place of privilege. Now, quite some time ago, you know, we had some conversation on this very show about what was happening to her in, you know, her experience. And then when I say quite some time ago, I'm talking about when she became Harry's wife, that the, we watched some of these dynamics unfolding and her struggling inside of those dynamics. And one of my comments was, it's because this is the first time that she's ever known that she was actually Black. There because we go. In, in California, she was just this, she was colorless. You know, that thing that we like to do, you know, like, you know, I don't see color. Well, she, if I don't see color had a face, it would have been Meghan Markle, you know? And so in the roles that she played on various shows, you, she always had a very colorless identity. Now, so every once in a while, they would represent her with one of her parents, if their parents were inside of the show, being a person of color. But it was just like a secondary thing, you know, like it was like the drapes inside of a room. It wasn't primary at all to any of her experiences, any of the conversations. Her love interests were almost always white men. So they, they were using her in a different kind of way. What was interesting is the struggle she experienced when she left the comfort of the United States to step into what was happening inside of the UK to realize the relative to the royal family, you was black as I am. And that was not what she was expecting. Even though she has a black mother, that experience had seemingly escaped her. So she was almost shocked by the fact that there is, an, there is an experience that Black women have that is very different than the experience you're having. And the privilege of being able to operate in this colorless perspective meant that she was ill-equipped for what happened when she stepped into the royal family. And so we were having some conversation about this and we were talking about the difference between, because my sisters 
husband, who of course naturally is my brother, we rarely say in-laws, but just to be clear for the distinctions of the show, is blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, he has never dated a white woman. So this is a white man. We call him light-skinned in our family. But it is a white man who has always love black women and we're not talking about cultural assimilation we're not talking about you know the ch on trend we're talking about a genuine sincere in that boy's heart he is light-skinned in his heart and that is no and he says to his mom all the time I, and he loves his mama i love his mom you know she's like a mom to me too and he always says all the time that it's absolutely of no insult to my mom i just happen to have always loved black women since i was young and when he when they had their girls, all of their girls look like Meghan Markle and they are very clear inside of that house. You are black. Now, that's not to erase him, but he's the first one to say you are black. Don't let that light skin get you in trouble, because what you need to understand about what this world is and how to effectively navigate this world means that you can't be under the impression that somehow having a paler hue of your skin makes it such as you get to float above the realities of blackness. You are black, your mama's black, and I'm light-skinned. That is his conversation with his children. And so when this happened, it really made me think about that. You know, and Megan's closest friend happens to be Serena Williams, or at least that's the way that it has been communicated. One of her closest girlfriends is Serena. And Serena happens to be married to a white man. So it's very interesting, you know, the conversations, because there's nothing about Serena that could pass for anything other than a true, beautiful Black woman. So this passing thing has an experience for us as people of color. Being light-skinned has an experience for us as people of color. Being able to exist outside of our phenotypic responses, our phenotypic presentation, as in uh, the shape of our nose, our mouth, our lips, doesn't look particularly ethnic. For those of us who don't look particularly ethnic, we get to be exotic as opposed to Black. And what does that mean for us and how our men relate to us because of it? So I just thought it was a very interesting thing because America is so deeply grappling with our relationship to race and color how that lays on our identities as women, how that lays on our relations is very interesting. And of course, as everybody knows, we just lost the queen in, in the UK. So we certainly, you know, our thoughts and prayers go to the family, but the royal fam family, certainly to Meghan and Harry's, you know, perspective, certainly had a racial undertone associated with that. And I, I in no way want to diminish the queen. I'm not there. I was not inside of those conversations. But what is being expressed suggests that the same layers that America struggles with are the very same layers that are happening there in Britain. So that would have been the thing that that I really thought about, you know, relative to, you know, coming out of this summer. What was going on out there? Yeah, you know, that whole scenario you described just really um, unpacks a lot of things uh, that we could discuss. And, you know, what's interesting is going back, first of all, we, we do offer our condolences to uh, the family uh, of Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. uh, II. It's really fascinating how that whole thing is Absolutely. playing out. Mm -hmm. um, she was queen for 70 years. That's Longest reigning monarch. Yeah, that's the longest that's reigning. To imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and now some people are coming out and saying it's not lost on black people that for 70 years, you know, colonialism has, it has expanded throughout the world and she has some part to play in that. Now, that's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you this, Alvin, because I know you're talking about race and gender. And um, what may be an interesting question is, let's say. And and Harry's her husband, right? I, I keep yep. forgetting that. Harry's hers. Yep. Okay. So Harry William left. Married. William is married to Kate. So Harry left to be with Megan, right? Now they're yep. living in the United States. So he gave up basically his privileges. Um, so let's say, for example, that they were black Ooh. and Megan was white. Do you think she would have had the same? challenges of assimilation if it were a white woman going into a black heirloom family versus what she megan had to experience going into a white one 
So that's a very interesting question. And I think Megan's experience makes that a little bit more complicated, you know, and that is to say that if Megan was a black woman who understood blackness going into whiteness, Megan would have had a different experience. And what I mean, different experience in terms of what she was prepared for, what she understood the dynamics to be, the understanding what the lay of the land is. The, uh, the problem for Megan is that she expected to come in the family and be treated as a white woman. And the fact that that did not happen, the fact that that Europe didn't respond to her as a white woman was what she was galled by. Like that, hold a second, clutch my pearls, you mean I'm black. And I'm not trying to be playful about it, but Megan did not understand that she was really black and that people saw her as that because we have we've so fetishized light skinnedness in America, even inside of our own cultures that we used to talk about it all the time relative to what girls got to be on the front of magazines, what girls got to be part of Victoria's Secret's photo shoots, what girls became supermodels with the exception of Naomi Campbell and you know a couple of others. Naomi was the first supermodel that was a real woman of color. We didn't see that very often in America. How many, how often the love interest in a majority white movie is ever gonna be a black woman? That did not happen in America until we, Houston was with Kevin Costner. We were shocked by that in The Bodyguard. You know, there are so many things that are true about how we operate and even who our Black men choose to be representative in our MTV and BET videos. They were always either a light-skinned woman or particularly if it was going to be romantic, she was light-skinned, right? And, and or she was, and that was the big thing, Black and Asian. That was the other thing that was the hot thing back in the day. You had to be mixed in some way. But it, truly Black women with, their, with our small waists and our big booties back then, we were only in those videos for sexual perspective, for purposes, not in terms of romantic love song kind of purposes. We were very rarely represented that way. We were represented in a fetishized fashion. So I would just say to your question, Kevin, that Megan would have had one, ex she still would have experienced racism. I think that that is going to be very real because we want to pretend it doesn't exist, but it is so very real. She would have experienced that, but she would have been better prepared for it had she been living as a woman of color rather than colorlessly. A white woman coming into a black family who knew she was white her whole life, I don't think that that's the same experience that you're going to have. And to be honest, as a people of color, generally speaking, we accept almost everybody. We will embrace you and make you one of our own. If you watch these dance videos, let there be one little white girl who can dance. Guess where the camera is? There are a hundred black people dancing flawlessly. One little white girl is dancing inside of that video. And we are so impressed by the effort and the interest in our culture that we, I mean, we so glorify it in the most positive kinds of ways. So it is rare that when you flip that, you know, think about it in your own congregations. You got white people who come to the church. We wrap our arms around folks to make sure you feel comfortable inside of this space, as opposed to quite the opposite. I don't know why you're here. I don't know if this church is for you. Black churches love seeing white folks show up to church. So like it is, it, it's just that we have a different experience. Where the We have always been as a culture, the catch-all space. We take in everybody. And quite frankly, there's some folks we should have not taken. <laughs> you know, like we, just, we should have yeah. lost some folks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and not that's... because they're white. There's some black folks we need to to kick out. <laughs> you know, like so. I'm just saying that we are we are very nine times out of ten we are a very ingratiating and accepting culture. We want you to be in here. Okay. All right, Tom. You you shook your head when I asked the question. You were like, "Nah, you think it to be a difference?" So. Explain to me why you think it would be a difference if it was in reverse. No, no, no. I was agreeing with, with Alvin. Uh, I believe that if she was white going into a black family, even a uh, royal family, I think her experiences would have been embracing because we tend to embrace other cultures, other people for their differences because we know what it feels, what it like, feels like to yep. be rejected. 
Yeah. We know what it's what it feels like to be ostracized. We know what it feels like to be the minority. So we we already know these 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 feelings and these emotions. And so when someone else is going through those things, we tend to have empathy for them because we know what it's what it feels like. So I, I think she'd have been perfectly fine. And I also agree that if she was dark skinned or a darker complexion and she had to deal with all the things that come along with that, because we don't talk about that a lot, um, particularly in our community, that on, there Anson. is intra racism in our community. Uh -huh. If you are dark skinned or mm -hmm. you are a darker complexion, we treat each other different, differently based upon Facts. how you look. And I've had a, a, a few conversations before, and it always trips me out when I had these conversations with uh, people who I call light bright. <laughs> or who uh you know we 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 call them uh red bones. Y'all yeah. know that term. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, look look at the fellas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Red bones. So when we have these conversations, sometimes it amazes me how naive they are concerning the intra racism. Mm. And they're like, I, I I never really saw that or I never really experienced. Of course you didn't experience that. You like bright. So ain't, ain't nobody treating you that way. But the darker you are, people tend to be more intimidated by you or people tend to shun you more or ostracize you more. Look at, I mean, you can look at your politics. You can look at your, your movies, your entertainment. It's all, it's all over the place. It, it crosses the whole spectrum. But we, um, we, we, we ostracize our own. So that, yeah, I think her experience would have been different. That, that, let's go there. So you said we don't talk about that much. Let's explore that. Okay. Because, yeah, you used to say the light skinned ones were in the house. They were the house Negroes, and the ones yep. with the dark, darker yeah. skin were, oh, yeah, were the, and we still were the do field it. Negroes, right? We still yep. do we still it do because, it. first of all, those light skinned ones were the master's kids, so yep. there was a little affinity towards them anyway and then they can relate to them more so because they were of a lighter complexion and many of them were light enough where they could so-called as we said back in the day pass, pass. yeah so you know uh, so if you could pass that means you literally were so lacking of uh that that what is it melanin melanin, melanin mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. melanin in your complexion that you actually could pass for a caucasian person mm -hmm. and so why wouldn't you be in the house? You're not going to mm -hmm. have a darkie in the house, as they will call us. They will mm -hmm. call us all kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. nonetheless. But at the end of the day, time, this is where I struggle with that. At the end of the day, whether you're in the house or in the field, you're still a slave. You're still a slave. Right? So how is it then that if I'm dark, and I understand I'm outside, it's hot, I get that, you inside. But again, when you look at those who are inside, we don't want to say nothing about Thomas Jefferson and, and, and mm -hmm. his love affair with with and, and the number of children he had with a slave. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Sally so Hemming. how is it then that we have decided amongst ourselves well after slavery, because slavery been over, right? Mm -hmm. That now we still carry that in our community, that there's still today some measure of, well, that's easy. you know, well, lighter that's easy. versus dark. That's easy because Here's the thing. When society as a whole oppresses a people, mm -hmm. you're always trying to be one up than somebody else. And mm -hmm. so that's where that crabs in the bucket comes in. I mean, that's basket come in mm -hmm. where you're trying to somehow be better than because you already are oppressed as a whole, as a race, mm -hmm. as a community. So if given some 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 advantage. In, in any way, I'll take it. That's the dysfunctionalism of societal racism because mm -hmm. of the, the dysfunctionalism of the societal racism will have some people say, well, I'll take the crumbs that I can get and I will shun you in order for me to be more accepted by the ones who is shunning all of us. Absolutely. That's the dysfunctionalism of societal racism. But, but you just said it. So we're jealous. Darker people are jealous over the light skinned people who have more of an end over the same people that are oppressing all of us. Oh, no, no, no we're not saying that. 
No, no, no. I'm not saying darker skinned people are having are jealous over light skinned people. I'm saying light skinned people will shun darker skinned people. Oh, the they do it to, to the darker skinned people. Yes. I'm I not got saying the dark skinned people it. are jealous of the light skinned people. If anything, the dark skinned people realize they gotta fight harder, they gotta scrap harder, they gotta work twice as good, and they gotta be twice as better because they already know what they're facing. That's why if Megan had been a darker skinned young lady, she would have already been prepared she for that. Better she prepared. Would have lived that experience yep. her entire life. So going over there would have made no difference to her because she's already used to it. So she already knows how to assimilate. She already knows how to navigate through those channels because she's lived that experience her entire life. But mm -hmm. when you can pass and you've not had that experience yep. and when people have accepted you because yep. they can't tell the difference, then you're like, well, wait a minute, where this is coming from? Because back in California, I, I was, was one of you. Right? Way. I was one of yep. y'all. But yep. now you treated me like I'm dark skinned. I don't That's know this experience. That's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ray, chime mm -hmm. in, Bishop. What's going on? Talk, give us your thoughts, man. Everything that Alvin and Anton have said is absolutely the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolute truth. Because what happens when you go back to the plantation system, you're looking at it. You got to look at it from this, uh, this, this vantage point. The field Negroes, if you will, looked at the house Negroes or the light-skinned ones, if you will, because there was a value ascribed to them in terms of how they were treated. So that value ascribed to them in terms of how they were treated opened access to opportunities that then carries over uh, societally in terms of open access to opportunities. Remember the brown bag test. Yep. So the lighter your skin is, HBCUs used to use it. Go. So you you getting into the universities, you're having mm -hmm. access to the job mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. opportunities to live in certain neighborhoods, and so there's an economic based upon. American's system, America's system of open access and opportunity, the lighter you are, the more access you have, the less of a threat you are. So the dark skinned ones didn't necessarily get access to that same opportunity. And the flip happens because you wouldn't think, uh, I'll just use us inside of the room. You wouldn't think Anton Bell, Kevin Swan, Alvin Lyons, Jason Covington, Ray Johnson, you wouldn't think that we would have the quote unquote attributes of the light skin because our education, our our articulation, our ability to be able to navigate biculturally certain spaces. And because the, the, I'm sure Anton may have had the experience, you know, going through law school, coming back into the neighborhood, uh, people calling you white boy. I had that experience coming mm -hmm. from, you know, Kevin, you and I were in New England together at the same time. But when we come back to the neighborhood, all of a sudden, here come the white boys. And our skin is just as dark as whatever, because we have access to opportunity through education that creates an economic advantage. So this kind of, you know, dualism that happens within our community really is what Anton said. It's the sickness of racism to further really divide us. Because when you put us all together, if I can say it this way from the movie Mo' Better Blues, whether you're Atrum, Quadrum, Madrum, you are still <laughs> having access to black skin. Right. So Megan found that out when she got over there. And I think the, the, <laughs> the difficult thing that kind of makes me chuckle a little bit, Alvin, is because you brought up the idea is that she didn't understand how black women live. And so when you get in that environment, racism is going to be here until Jesus comes, okay? Oh, for and sure. the idea of colonialism is going to be here until Jesus comes. And so it would behoove us, regardless of what our skin tone is, as black folks, we really, now more than ever, because we can go into the policy dynamics of this, which is why we're seeing what's here when it comes to voting rights and all of that kind of stuff, we better have stick together. And we're going to see some open opportunities take place for us educationally, politically, and economically. So Yeah, that's I'm good. Gonna... And, and listen, I agree with all of y'all, but you know, I gotta have the purposes of radio. I, I completely agree with all you, you you got to. That's what you need to do, Kevin. Uh, but... Let me just, let me say one thing, Kevin, before you, you you say what you're getting ready to say. If we're honest about it, we might not we might not openly say it right here, but the reality is even some of these folks right here on this this here stage make comments about whether or not 
such and such is light skin and whether or not such and such, because my husband happens to have hazel eyes and that that's valued in our community. And we know that it's valued in our community. And we know that because of that, that our spouse in my case, or our kids or whatever are going to have a slightly different experience just by virtue of the fact that they got this slight thing that makes them just a little more European. You know, we will affectionately speak of each other based on skin tone. Come on over here, chocolate, a light skin, a high bright, you know, like, and, and and the truth is, we fetishize it too in our own subconscious ways. So like, I mean, the fact that I wear a weave, people don't realize my natural hair is as long as my weave is, but it just takes too freaking long to blow dry this thing when it rains outside. So the only reason I wear a weave and I keep pictures just so the folks don't think, oh, that girl probably bald headed under there. I always be like, look right here. You know, like I literally have to keep pictures to be able to validate the fact that I'm not trying to perpetrate a fraud. I'm just lazy, y'all. That's all it really comes down to. You know, <laughs> it's just, but I recognize that there are benefits in white America for the fact that my hair looks more European and the fact that I'm educated and the fact that I grew up in white in exclusively white environments and that I can go from sounding completely West Indian to sounding, speaking in Ebonics to sounding like, Hi guys, my name is Becky. And oh my God, it was just so crazy what was going on last week when we were doing <laughs> such and such because I grew up around all of it. And there <laughs> are privileges associated with being able to blend in. And some of us tap into them and we use them for the benefit of our own. And some of us tap into them to be able to shut the door so that no more like us can get behind, can get inside. We use it in all kinds of different ways. We weaponize our access sometimes. So I just, you know, just being honest about how many layers are really inside of this. To your point, Kevin, there are tons of layers and we, none of us are completely absolved from the experience of recognizing the value of some of those accessibilities that may exist for each of us through our kids, through our own experiences or the like. We prize it too, even though we don't like to acknowledge it. Yeah, and if you're just tuning in, we're having a great conversation today. We're talking about hot topics. We caught our eye over the summer. Alvian has the floor today, and she's <laughs> talking about Meghan Markle and her adjustment or lack thereof uh, mm -hmm. to realizing that in Great Britain, you are still seen as African American. Black woman, period. Whereas yep. here in America, you are able to move and flow as you saw it, and maybe it wasn't brought to your attention, which then led to a conversation about uh, how we look at each other amongst ourselves, the whole light skin versus dark skin uh, scenario. So we want you to chime in, give us your thoughts, drop them in the Pastor Study Facebook feed. We will definitely check them out. Jay, I want to come to you, man. And like I said, I agree with everything. So I'm, you know, but for radio, we got to have fun. Yeah, you know, we got to keep it interesting. <laughs> so Jay, look, it's clear that you and I, in historical times, would be in the field. <laughs> You know, we we will be inside. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Jay, Jay, you and I. Todd, can I put you in there too? Todd, we is outside, bro. Now, that I'll be outside. Jay, maybe we don't know, but we gonna be outside. <laughs> we gonna be outside. So, <laughs> so, so, so Jay, are you telling me that today, today, I ain't talking about back then, you still feel like there are, you, there are certain advantages that you don't have? Because you are a darker skinned black man. How much time do we have left? Yeah. Show? You gonna ask me something silly like that? I mean, it, it's how well, does it play out? How I'm does it play out that you think that I'm there's a dis simply because you are darker, you are darker complexion? I, I may have to defer to my sister, uh, Dr. Lyon, because she's way more eloquent with speech, <laughs> but I, I would say, um. Number one, you look at you look down upon it as if you're ignorant or mm -hmm. um, a thug. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm, I'm dark skin. I got a full beard. Um, mm -hmm. I'm already I'm either a drug dealer or mm -hmm. some kind of entertainment individual. I can't be the Commonwealth of Attorney. I can't be a distinguished businessman. I, um, I would even it's funny because when I go buy cars, I don't do it now. But when I first start buying cars. I will always go to the dealership with a suit and tie on because mm -hmm. there was a level of respect that a black man with a certain a suit and tie would get that I wouldn't get in my Levi's or in 
um, cut off, you know, shirt or something like that. I'm, I'm looked at differently. So it's not just about skin tone. It's about how you package where you are. But I will say, interestingly enough, the the tables have shifted a little bit when you come down to the colorism of light skin versus dark skin. Now, dark skin is, is, is now becoming more in versus um, light skin. But you still hear, you know, darky or, you know, um, like, you know, again, field Negro, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's still um, some level of difficulty in navigating in the space that um, I mean, because I'm, I'm a master's um, degree individual. Um, soon be going back to get my terminal degree. But again, when you go back into the spaces that you ret- that you return to, you looked at as uh, Uncle Tom or you think you better than me. No, I'm just trying to do better with the opportunities I've been given that you could do the same thing, but you choose to stay on the corner to be a dope boy, or you just you want to be at the house watching your girl's Cox cable while she's at work. Those are the decisions that you have made that I refuse to make. But me and Dr. Lyons' doctor have had that conversation, and I am guilty of um, that colorism because I, we are quick to say, and I will give the disclaimer if it offends, I apologize. Ask pretty Ricky with, with good hair. What right. defines good hair versus right. bad hair? But but we Say do it. it, and we we do it so quickly and so nuanced that we don't even know Wait, that think inside about our it. own community, yep. our own yep. culture, we are yep. spewing various racial undertones. Yep. Um, and but we don't we don't think about that. So it's difficult, but you you learn. You learn to make it do what it do. So it, it's not um, a barrier, if it, if you will. And if it becomes a barrier, you turn it into an opportunity. So I may not be accepted here. That's fine. I'll go over to Yorktown where I can do what I need to do. So it, it's you, you got to navigate that and be smart. You just got to be smart. So, Todd, you, you come with attorney, man. You're interacting with everybody in the city, man. And Jason, by the way, well said, uh, definitely well said. Um, so And so, Anton, do you think that your darker complexion becomes a factor for you in, in your work as Commonwealth Attorney and how you are perceived? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, how I, it, here's the thing. I know based upon just my history and my past that I got to come to the table twice as good. I got to come to the table Mm-hmm. twice as researched on my topic or my mm-hmm. subject matter. I got to mm-hmm. come to the table twice as articulate. I have to come to the table mm-hmm. twice as experienced and knowledgeable in my area of expertise, simply mm-hmm. because uh, as a one of my mentors once told me, who was a dark-skinned man, and he was an elected official, he said, uh, when you are an elected white man, you are assumed to be competent day one until you do something that shows that you're not competent. But when you are an elected black man, you are assumed to be incompetent and you have to prove your competence. Yeah. So yeah. I've always, and he said that early on in my career. So I've always navigated channels based on that, that belief system that I have to show my competence. So in my office, I knew that I couldn't just do status quo. I knew that I had to take it up uh, a couple of notches and then some more because for me to be able to showcase the skills, talents, abilities, and anointing that's on my life, I had to be able to objectively hit metrics that no one could be able to criticize and say that Mm -hmm. I did not hit Mm -hmm. the job standards the way I should have hit them. Mm -hmm. Let me me clarify that because yes, all of us have been raised in the black community. You got to be twice as good, right? We, we, and that normally has been compared to white people, right? Just because of privilege. What I'm asking everybody now is go there. Go what ahead. I'm asking everybody now is, do you feel like you got to be twice as good as a dark skinned black man? Whereas maybe a lighter version, if you are lighter skinned and still black, do you still feel like you would have to work as hard as you would as a darker skin? I'm not comparing now 
us to white people. I'm comparing us now to within our race. Mm -hmm. Do you within feel that race? way? Oh, absolutely. Even within our race, because as a dark skinned man, I'm looked at as an angry black man. And so I have to check that and have to watch. And here's the thing. Everybody in my family is loud. We laugh <laughs> loud. We play loud. We get angry loud. We just do loud. That's just who we are. Mm -hmm. But I have to watch how I communicate certain things in certain environments. Because if I'm not careful, then my loudness, just which I'm loud in general, can be taken as he's a loud black man. And I know yep. for a yep. fact is because I'm a dark skinned man. It's not just because I'm a black man, it's because I'm a dark skinned black man. I think being a dark skinned black man intimidates more. And so uh. I have to also be careful of my my tone my mm -hmm. my my mm -hmm. uh mannerism mm -hmm. i mean you just you you just you're mm -hmm. as after a while you 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 really it becomes second nature mm -hmm. so you don't have to you know try to turn that knob or or, or turn that that's that 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 station to get to that to that mode it's, it becomes a part of who you are and sometimes you catch yourself doing it and you're like why why am i doing that Mm -hmm. But you already know if you don't, this is going to be the perception that people are going to have. Can, can I say something right there to that to that point, Anton? It's funny you say that because when we, I first met you years ago on the show, I was I was intimidated and and for real afraid of you because <laughs> you you a big dude mm -hmm. and you about your business. It, it wasn't because you were rude to me. It wasn't because that you said anything out of the way to me. Like legitimately, and when we became friends and brothers, I was like, "This is the coolest dude since like a uh, uh, break." But it but was, the it question, was, Jay, the question, Jay, is: Were you intimidated if initially, not just because he was a big dude, but he was he was a big dark skinned yeah, black that, dude? Like yeah. if he was light skinned, would you have felt intimidated? No, nah, because I. I and this may come off kind of rude. See, he's about <laughs> it, to say it. It may come off kind of rude. So I'm sorry if I offend any of my light See, skin brothers. That, this is my point. But, Go ahead, but say light, it, light skin people are, to me are soft. So I'm not going to be scared. I knew of you. he was going to say now, it. My, bla my black and my dark skin guys are a little we'll rough, a little rugged. So yeah. We'll immediately, go yeah. So immediately, that's, that's what I was like, yo, why did that? I mean, he looked good. I mean, he looked good. He had a suit and tie on. But I was like, yo, I'm not going to play with him first. But if you were light-skinned, oh, man, Rudy Poo, I'd be like, what's up, dude? Yeah, and see, and both, and, and see, this is how we are stereotyping in our own community, exactly right? 100%. Because right? there are exactly some rugged, light-skinned brothers, right? Oh, and then there are some soft, dark-skinned brothers, right? 100%. And, and, so, and so, Tom, that's why I want to go back real quick, and then, Ray, I'm coming to you, because you said, I got to be careful not to be viewed as an angry black Dark skinned black man. So if you are loud, like you say you are now, but you're light skinned, are you still being viewed as an angry black man or something else? No. And I'll give you a perfect example. So I was at a function just last week and there was this light skinned guy. And he was bright light and he was just as loud as loud. Matter of fact, he may have had some in him because he was just as loud and he was just as uh gregarious and he he was lively and the whole night not one ounce of me saw him as intimidating at all just more of the life of the party that's how mm -hmm. i saw him me i could never do that i could never get away with that and it was a black audience but i could never get away with that yep so you stereotyped him Thinking he could do something you couldn't do simply because no, he's lighter than you. I'm not stereotyping him and saying that he can get away with it. I'm just saying my perception of him was very docile. And my right. perception of, uh, of what I saw other people and how they interacted with him, just based on my observation in that in that time frame, everybody just seemed very, you know, loving and, and wonderful, whatever. Comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. They were very comfortable, comfortable. but mm -hmm. me doing that, I know I could not have gotten away with that at all. Mm -hmm. This is at fascinating. This, this is fascinating yeah. here, boy. Like, like Ray, talk to me, man. Like, like you know, do you feel that 
darker skinned black men get a completely different view. Like according to Jason and, and Anti, if it's lighter skin, the thought is I'm good. <laughs> right. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm they softer. That's what that's their words. No, but no, no. That was not my word. Not that's softer. Jason's word. Okay, I'm, I'm saying that, yeah, I'm cool with that there's a comfort level. Uh, here's the thing: it's a it's a comfort level. So it's not necessarily that they're soft. It's just I'm comfortable around you. Why I, are you I'm, more comfortable with light skinned people than your own complexion? How about this? I didn't make up the rules. I it's just tell you what they're living are. in it. I'm just, I'm just oh, living who, in it. Who told Who told you that? Like that's my I'm, point. Who taught you that? Who taught you <laughs> that you're supposed to be more concerned with people your own complexion? I'm about to tell you. I'm gonna tell you who taught me that. People taught me that. Y'all people. I would say a bunch of y'all Negroes taught me that. That's who taught me that. Because y'all showed me through life experiences that that's the way it is. I mean, and I'm not saying it's everybody. Of course it's not everybody, but I'm saying it's it happened far too frequently for me to not have noticed. That's mm -hmm. Tom, don't you lock up light skinned people too? I well, mean, come on now. Let me he tell you. He so, he's so, an evil so, opportunity so, locker up. This, this is my point, Todd, huh, right? I'm you locking saying. up as many light skinned people as you are dark skinned people, right? Yeah, I don't care what color you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Ray, come on, Ray. Talk to us, Ray. Talk to us. But, us. Kevin, Kevin, I think the part that you, that, that you may be missing in this discussion for the purposes of radio is <laughs> that the societal uh, implications that come to us systematically from racism that impact us psychologically are deeply ingrained in our community. So because of the access to opportunity that lighter skinned people have had, darker skinned people are viewed to be less intimidating because of that. So that is something that is psychologically and deeply ingrained inside of the fabric of America. Because, of course, we know, Alvin, you know this, that the concept of race is a fabricated idea uh, that, that has been brought to us to create yep. the systematic inequities yep. that we experience yep. based upon skin tone. So yep. the whole idea of it is a whole farce to begin with. I'll come to us in the church, and this is a taboo subject that we haven't had a chance to discuss yet pending how much time we got left in the show. You know good and well that um, as much as black churches embrace white people in terms of coming in, in regardless of denomination, and this is a very bold statement that I'm about to make, regardless I know where you're going. I know where you're going to. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how educated we are, how articulate we are, how well we can exegete the text and how well, how well we have the science of hermeneutics down. Black men or black women, too, for that matter, are not necessarily ascribed to being seen as spiritual persons to be able to lead in a dominant culture. So mm -hmm. that just simply means that white folks is ain't, ain't following black people like that in terms of leadership. Now, we could be on the praise team as a worship leader. We could uh, be musicians at the church, but mm -hmm. eldership leveling up, those who make the decisions, oh, that's not happening because of the systematic, ingrained, psychological view of who blacks are deemed to be. So okay. that is okay. something that crosses the entire spectrum. And I don't think that we in the church that we own that enough to be able to have, see how that kind of plays itself out. It, it really doesn't play out too well. Most multicultural churches, I'll even go here. Most multicultural churches that are that are 50-50 split, black, white, or any other kind of background into them, they are led by white men. They or are something led. or an other. You got it, you're an other, other, but you're not black. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's do the other for a second, Alvin. Let's take, if it's a Hispanic male that's leading it, he doesn't look black and he's married to a white woman. Absolutely. So the church still wrestles with this today. Yeah, there's no question about that. And so I know we're coming up on time. So Alvin, help me to understand, for the purposes of radio, what, right. what, I'm, hearing, what I'm hearing today is we see lighter skinned blacks as less intimidating psychologically speaking. Mm -hmm. And going, more, more attractive. Let right, me add to right. that too. We so also we're going, see them and as we're more going attractive. across the spectrum. Yep. So if lighter skinned blacks are less intimidating and more attractive, 
Mm -hmm. And that means whites have to be the standard in some way in our That's mind. That's correct. That's correct. Right? Yep. So then, somebody help me understand how are whites the standard when they are the ones oppressing us? See, this, this is what we don't talk about. Right? But that's and, and, now, and now, Ray, I'm going to go to Scripture. And, and I'm going to go, Ton, because, you know, you like Old Testament. So in, in Samuel, this is what God dealt with. God was mad at the people. Why was he mad at the people? Because they wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to be right? like everybody else. They wanted a king, right? right? And God is saying, why do you need a king when I have provided everything for you? That's but right. they still have their eyes on trying to be like somebody else. Mm -hmm. And and I just am asking the question, are we as a people, I don't care how light or dark we are, are we still suffering from the same complex of trying to be like somebody else who has proven historically okay. they so ain't false? Let, let me throw this in there. So if you talk to some the, the elders, some of the elderly uh, African American uh, 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 people in our community, some of them will tell you that integration was the worst thing we could have ever, ever happened to people of color. Yep. Some people will say that. Now, that's yep. going to be a bomb for some people. Some people yep. will struggle some with that. Will, some people some will people say will that. Some struggle with that. But I, and I, and I was talking to one who was from Alabama. She was from Birmingham, where, you know, they call it Birmingham because they would bomb you down mm -hmm. in my hill in Birmingham. She lived yep. on, in, on, on that street. Mm -hmm. uh, so she said, we wanted equality. She said, but what ended up happening is we began to take on their characteristics, their traits, and their particular negative habits that you didn't typically see within our community. We also tended to, to navigate away from village, which is how yeah, we survive. That's, that, and and see, to, that's 100% yeah. true, Anton, in terms of what Come has on. happened historically. Because when we left the Afrocentric perspective of how we operated and we traded that in for a westernized orientation to the culture, we left collectivism and we moved to individualism. And when we did that, we did not calculate for the fact that the playing field is never going to be level, right? Never. So because it's never going to be level, the only thing that helps us to be able to start to move that needle is collectivism. But by by allowing the infiltration of values and culture, and I'm not in any way, and let me be clear for anybody listening on radio, we're just talking about the historical perspective and what the implications associated. In no way are we suggesting that we don't love our white brothers and sisters in That's any right. form or fashion. That's our right. family is multicultural, as are many inside of this, this studio. Okay, So I just want to be clear about that. We're just talking about the history associated with this. And because of that fact, when we moved away from collectivism into individualism, it for us had exponential impact because the white community can afford to operate from an individualistic perspective because there is not a gravitational pull already working against you. So you have the opportunity to just run your individual race. It could be a solo solo game. But when there's a gravitational force that you're working against, the only thing to help offset it is the power of the collective to strengthen the whole to be able to move away from that particular weight. Because we did not understand that, we looked at, well, wow, our white brothers and sisters are doing extraordinarily well. How do they live their lives? And we started to lay those things on us and they do not translate. Just the same way that there are certain parts of the Bible that when you move them from Hebrew to English, we lost some of the understanding associated with it because we did not have an English term that matched the Hebrew origin to its exact definition. When you translate Italian to English, Japanese to English, every time you translate something, you lose something in translation. And that happened in our culture too. When we attempted to translate individualism into a culture that is designed for collectivism, we lost something inside of that. And so, and we have been unable to regain it, period. 
And there's no other way it's ever going to happen until we get back together as a culture. But it is so deeply ingrained in us to just look out for us. And I'm only looking out for my four no more that while we keep orienting like that, we're the ones who lose. We lose and we don't lose individually. We lose as a collective. So it's just amazing how the math works, but we're unwilling to address it. Killer Mike, for all of his controversial perspectives, I happen to respect him enormously. And he speaks in a level of honesty that is uncomfortable. Anton, as we talk about comforts, is uncomfortable for most people to listen to. And he constantly talks about the impact of what we're doing in terms of denying what works for us, just the same way as believers. And then I'll hush, as believers, y'all, we can't do what non-believers do. Because what they're able to get away with, they can get away with because they're not answering to a God. We can't do those same things because the rules on the planet we live on are based on the Bible. So you go do the same thing the next person did and you watch how God just, look, child, I'm always going to love you, but my hand can't be on what you just did. Which means that for you who has to live on this planet, it has significant impact how that slapped you in your behind for what it is that you did that everybody else does every day of the week. And then finally, I'll say this, Kevin, when you ask, why do we keep doing what the next person is doing? And this is something Killer Mike was talking about. Why are we trying to be like the oppressor for sake of radio and talking about it from a historical cultural perspective? It is no different than the fact that you'll find more Mercedes in the freaking hood than you're going to find up in the Beverly Hills. We don't own a freaking thing, but we're running out here trying to buy stuff to try to feel like something that we on the inside don't feel like we are. I've talked about this before. The person, the people who need to hear Black Lives Matter are Black people. It's not white people we have to convince that Black Lives Matter. We haven't even convinced ourselves that Black Lives Matter. So until we start to deal with the stuff that we are looking for exterior validation and um, acceptance and affirmation through, we'll keep chasing everything, catching absolutely nothing because we're chasing it for the wrong reasons. You can't solve spiritual things with carnal solutions. And that what we're doing over and over again, how we prize, we could talk about white folks all we want, but let there be a little white woman who comes in here and has a little half black baby with us. We had that grandchild all over Facebook. You know why? Because he got curly hair and his eyes are light and he's so freaking cute. But let her, let her bring Ubuntu home. And then and you got this very chocolate, nappy-headed baby. That baby ain't making into none of the pictures on Facebook. Poor thing, just, just not even in you. You're feeding the baby with a slingshot because that's the way we do in the Black community, how we treat what it is that we should love and it's self-hatred that is destroying us. So I'm saying, love your brothers and sisters. We need to love our white brothers and sisters. But baby girl, let me tell you what we need to love even more than that. We need to learn how to love ourselves. And because we don't, all the stuff is messed up. We are messing all ourselves up because to the hungry heart, every bitter thing is sweet. When you empty on the inside, you're gonna chase all this nonsense and all it does is poison your system. Okay, and now I'm done. <laughs> Look, ain't nothing else to be said behind that because I think you summed it up and, and we're out of time and and to wrap up the point Alvin this is what Megan found out the hard way yes one drop the of black hard way one drop of black one whether you're the lightest skin black one Don't drop care. you're still black yep. right so, but now what we gotta do is be able to say I don't care what shade of black you are right, That's right. the way we survive here is not yeah. trying to be like them, but coming together and keeping ourselves together and holding our families up in spite of what they try to do to us. And somewhere along the line, we lost that lesson in pursuit of trying to be like them. We're going to end it like that. We'll pick this back up next week. Until next time, be blessed and be a blessing to someone else. This is Smooth 88.1 WHOV iHeartRadio right here, y'all. Facebook Live.